My Lords, just before lunch, I was uh, concluding my remarks on uh, Farrell and Whitty. Yes. Uh, and uh, I was about to, uh, to come to paragraphs uh, 37 and following. I'll take them uh, quickly because they've been gone through by my learned friend. Uh, it's tab 12 still in the authorities bundle at page 1230. Yeah. <coughs> At 37, the court mentions the importance attached by the EU legislature to the protection of picketings, which led it to supplement those arrangements by requiring member states under Article 1.4, now Article 10, to establish a body with the task of providing compensation at least to the limits laid down by EU law. Uh, and uh, the court itself points out uh, that Insurance obligation under Article 1.1 refers to Article 3.1 of the first directive. Uh, 38, therefore, the task, the task that a compensation body such as the Irish MIB is required by a member state to perform a task that contributes to the general objective of victim protection pursued by the EU legislation relating to uh, insurance must be regarded as a task in the public interest that is inherent in this case in the obligation imposed on the member states by Article 1.4 of the second directive. Uh, and so that the, uh, the CJU's identification of the Irish MIB as being the type of body, uh, uh, being the body uh, that is responsible for the task, uh, grounds not only on the fact uh, that it is the body that has been made responsible for that kind of, that type of activity by the state, but also uh, that it is a task in the public interest. And that echoes the distinction drawn in the uh, Advocate General's opinion between uh, emanations of the state acting in the public interest and emanations otherwise acting in a purely commercial capacity. That's the distinction drawn there. There was some mention of that in my learned friend's skeletal argument, but he didn't develop it. Uh, orally today. So one asks, uh, is this a task in, in the public interest? Yes, clearly it is. Uh, and moreover, it is the task in Article 3, with which the body in Article uh, 1, 4, now <coughs> Article 10, has been tasked by the state. Uh, and that is where we come to that key passage, 39, where uh, it must be borne in mind uh, that in case of damage, for which the insurance obligation provided for in Article 3 has not been satisfied, the court has held that the intervention of such a body is designed to remedy the failure of a member state to fulfill its obligation to ensure that civil liability in respect to the use of motor vehicles normally based in its territory is covered by insurance. And there is the reference there to Chonka, and there's been the debate, of course, with my learned friend, as to whether uh, that goes further or merely uh, reflects my Lord, I do rely on the fact that this is the clearest possible statement from uh, the CJEU as to the scope of the responsibility of the body. And it is to fulfil uh, the obligation to ensure that the civil liability in respect of the use of motor vehicles normally based in the territory is covered by insurance. And that is, in my respectful submission, the true import of the coextensive nature of the obligations under Article 3 and Article 10, uh, and it is uh, uh, the true nature of the task that the body uh, is to be held responsible for under EU law. And it is, of course, the decision of the Grand Chamber, so it has the, the added weight and authority as opposed to <coughs> some middle court split on for that reason. Oh, well. indeed. Indeed it is. Um, uh, and um, there's then reference to what is common ground in this case and also referred to in the judgment by the learned judge below at paragraph 115, which is why uh, the Irish MIB uh, has the public uh, interest task and the special powers for it at 40. And then the court simply reiterates or restates that the provisions of a directive that are unconditional and sufficiently precise may consequently be relied upon 
against an organization such as the Irish MIB, and concludes, in the light of the foregoing, the answer to the second and third questions is that provisions of a directive that are capable of having direct effect may be relied on as against a private body on which a member state has conferred a task in the public interest, such as that inherent in the obligation of the member states by Article 1.4, and which for that purpose possesses special powers. Now, the uh, conclusion at 42 may sound somewhat abstract, but in fact what the court is saying is that the provisions of this directive that we are here concerned with, and in particular, not only what was Article 3.1 and uh, Article 1.1, uh, but also Article 1.4, so Article 3 and Article 10 of the current directive, uh, it is saying they are unconditional, they are sufficiently precise, and they may be relied upon against an organisation such as the Irish MIB. And there is no organization that is more such as the Irish MIB uh, than the UK MIB, which is to all intents and purposes uh, the same. So my Lord, as my Lord, Lord Justice Flo uh, put it to me, uh, whether hopefully or uh, otherwise, I could rest my case there. Uh, I don't in fact propose to go uh, on uh, very much longer. Uh, but out of deference to my learned friend Mr. Uh, Mercer's arguments, I do want to make some other remarks about the authorities uh, that he has referred the court to. And, well, uh, I'm certainly speaking for myself. I would be helped, I think, by uh, you in dealing with his point about, about whether there's a difference between a breakdown of the system, Sonka, paragraph 31, and a failure to put in place a system at all. My Lord, yes. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that. Um, come to it in your own court. I will. Uh, Lord, I'd, I'd like to start briefly, because I've really already made the point, but this time with references, uh, with the frankovich Garevaran full use of the uh, discretion point. Uh, Frankovich is at authorities bundle, main authorities bundle 20. Sorry, is that right? I may have 19. 19, forgive me. Uh, and I really only want to go to it to make good the point that I made in passing at paragraph um, paragraph 23, page 5411, is the wording of Article 5 of that different directive. And as I, I said, that directive, for what it's worth, said that member states should lay down detailed rules for the organisation, financing and operation of the Guarantee Institutions Bureau, complying with the following principles in particular. And uh, there are then uh, more detailed uh, provisions for uh, those sorts of institutions. <coughs> and as I've um, already indicated in passing, the frankovich wagner mire uh, line of case law really found its conclusion in Garevaran, which is at tab 8 of this bundle. Sorry, is that right? At tab 3 of this bundle. And uh, the short way into Garevaran, I submit, is by looking at paragraph 1 of the opinion of the Advocate General on page 7690. Uh, and in particular, the second question, at the, the last uh, sentence of paragraph 1, the National Court raises the question, it's about eight lines up from the end, uh, whether where a member state designates itself as the institution liable for the guarantee under the directive, an employee may rely on that guarantee despite being excluded from it under a national provision, if that provision cannot be based on Sweden's reservation with regard to the directive. So that's what had happened here. Uh, Sweden had designated uh, a body uh, by saying, well, we will do it uh, ourselves. Um, and uh, the discussion around Frankovich and Wagner Mire is uh, uh, taken up for present purposes at paragraph 37. 
of the judgment. Of Forgive the judgment. me. It's at page 7719. Uh, there's reference to Frankovich at 37, and then Wagner Mire at 38. And then over the page, uh, 39, it must, however, be pointed out in this regard that unlike the situations described in the paragraphs above, in which the member states, uh, state has still not used the discretion it enjoys or has made only partial use, the main proceedings concern a situation in which the member state concerned has designated itself the person liable to meet claims of pay guaranteed under the directive. So the court there despite it being a very different uh, set of facts and despite a slightly different uh, terms, the slightly different terms of the directive, the court sees this very straightforwardly uh, as a case where Sweden has said, we are the person liable to meet claims of pay guaranteed under the directive. And in the same way, I say, uh, the UK has said that the MIB is uh, the person liable to meet claims under the directive, and that is how the UK has implemented, purports to have implemented the directive. Uh, in such circumstances, says the CJEU of 40, it must be accepted that the Member State has made full use of the discretion with which it enjoys. Uh, 41, the last few lines, it can no longer be maintained. The Member State must still take measures to give effect to Article 5 of the directive, so no further measures are now required. Um, and uh, at 43, it must be held the existence of discretion enjoyed by the member states as regards the setting up funding and functioning guarantee institutions cannot be validly invoked for the purposes of preventing Mrs. Garevran from relying in the national courts as against Sweden on the right to claim pay guaranteed by the directive. Uh, just as a private individual must be able to rely on the right which he has under a precise and unconditional provision of the directive, when that provision is separable from other provisions of the same directive, which do not have the same degree of precision or unconditionality, that individual must be allowed to rely on provisions conferring on him in a precise and unconditional way the status of beneficiary of a directive once the discretion given to the member state with regard to other provisions whose non-implementation was the only obstacle to the effective exercise of the right invested in the individual by the directive has been fully used. And, and as it happens, that uh, same discussion that we have been having today uh, was uh, also had before my Lord, Lord Justice Flo, as Mr. Justice Flo, in Bern at first instance. Uh, and I just uh, take your Lordships to that reference. It's uh, Authorities Bundle 7. Uh, Bern was that case. Um, that this case has in effect overturned in that at the time of Byrne, what stood between uh, Mr. Byrne and recovery against the MIB was whether or not the MIB was an emanation of the state. And, and the reason it wasn't an emanation of the state back then was because that hadn't yet been explained in the way it has now been explained by Advocate General Sharpston and the CJEU in Fowl and Witty Number 2. It was thought that the um, conditions in Foster were conjunctive, not disjunctive, mm -hmm. and one can see why, because that's what paragraph 20 of Foster said. Yeah, right. Uh, but a slight sense of sleight of hand, really. <laughs> none the worse for that, but nonetheless. <laughs> well, nonetheless, there, there, right. there it is. And we, we said, uh, in turn, before Mr. Justice Sewell in Burnham, um, there was one piece of uh, jigsaw, or perhaps mosaic, that was missing in Burnham, and that was the emanation of the state that's now been supplied by Fowler and Whitty number two, uh, which he has accepted in, uh, in the judgment below. Mm. Uh, but on the way to that finding, uh, which was then upheld by this court, um, uh, your lordship at um, page 89, um, paragraphs 54 to 56, mm. had essentially the same discussion we've been having this morning. Uh, the claimant there intended European community case law in this area has moved on. Uh, particular reliance is placed on the decision in Lick Scatterbird against Gary Brown. So, where are you reading from? Uh, 54. 54. 89D. I'm sorry, it was page 89, not paragraph. Yep. Um, particular reliance is placed on Gary Brown, uh, and it's explained there that that considered the same directive as Frankovich and Wagner Mirror. 
free to stay to designate it itself, and so on. In 55, the court distinguished Frank religion by Mary on the grounds there were cases in which members of state hadn't used the discretion uh, to employ or only partially. Uh, there's then a recital of what the court held, that was paragraph 44, uh, which is what the bit that I've just read out from Narevo. And the conclusion in 56, that Mr. Payne's, uh, well known for Mr. Payne's QC, who was then for the claimant, uh, submits that this reasoning is equally applicable here. I respectfully uh, echo my learned friend's point. Where the United Kingdom has chosen to designate the MIB as the body through which it seeks to implement directly agency power. The relevant discretion has been fully used and cannot seriously be suggested that somehow as in Bath and Mirror, the discretion has only been partially used. And I accept that submission. From that, uh, I rely on. also mentioned in passing uh, the case of Hampshire, which is in our scope of argument, it, it doesn't really, in, in my respective submission, add uh, very much, save that it's another illustration yeah. of how that principle has been applied. To and and, and ju ju just on that last point before we move on, the, in a sense, the point that Mr. Uh, Mercer was making this morning was really an, an, an echo, wasn't it? what Lord Justice Schuman had said in Needle and Reading, which I quoted at paragraph 52. That the, uh, in effect, he thought that it was open to the MIB to, to open to the government to fulfil its obligations under the directive in any number of ways, uh, of which um, the MIB was only one and it could fulfil other obligations in other ways. Yeah. And, you, and you say, well, that, that, um, that's inconsistent with the subsequent Certainly with Garrett, I mean, it's uh, that and also inconsistent, I say, with the wording of the directive itself. Yeah. Yes, your lordship is right. It is deja vu for your lordship, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> for a long, long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was my first trial as a judge, I seem to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and fairly early exposure to European law, which I didn't do very much of in my own time. <laughs> so, Hard luck. <laughs> <laughs> Things um, have moved on, as you would say. Yes, well, yeah. Um, as, as a reflection of how the law then stood, um, perfectly accurate until it found the nitty cable and spoilt it slightly at the end. Um, so, my lords, um, I, I wasn't really going to address Hampshire in any uh, detail. Uh, it, it's a similar case. It relies, and apply, it relies upon and applies foul and witty number two in the context of a responsibility for fulfilling the obligation on member states to protect the interests uh, of employees regarding old age benefits under a supplementary occupational pension scheme. The UK devolved that responsibility upon the PPF and the fact that not all aspects of that task uh, have been uh, expressly devolved didn't stop the Court of Justice finding that the board of the Pension Protection Fund was liable as an emanation of the state in those circumstances. So it's, it's no longer simply Farrell and, and this directive, it's also uh, now um, Hampshire and that directive, and there may be other cases to come. And Two short points, just picking up uh, uh, issues that my learned friend raised this morning. Uh, one of the issues that uh, my learned friend uh, raised uh, was, well, there could be all of these other um, types of liability for, um, I think, dodgems were mentioned, and, and indeed um, uh, vehicles that maybe only move around on private land. I, I do want to... Uh, recall at some stage, and this is as good as any, that I am only here advocating for the direct effect, the directly effective rights of my client on the facts of this case. As the CJU has consistently pointed out uh, in its case law, uh, uh, cases such as um, Monica Wright, Central of Estfang and others, uh, the uh, only relevant right that you're dealing with on a directly effective 
uh, rights claimed is that of this claimant. I don't have to establish what the position is in relation to Dodgens or ride on mowers, and neither does this court. My client has a directly uh, effective right in this case, which involves an uninsured car that a few months before the accident was insured, uh, and a vehicle that until a few moments before the accident was on a public road. And I, I do rely, although this is perhaps something of uh, uh, a rather factual point, but I do rely on it being uh, fanciful to suggest that the UK would create a separate body for accidents occurring in the circumstances of my client's case. <laughs> there, there may well be wider considerations, but with all due respect, they're, they're not for me. Well, if, you're, if, if, if Mr Tyndale had, uh, had uh, swerved off the road and run your client down the gateway of the bid, there would be quite a strong argument for saying that would be covered by the MIB agreement uh, in the normal course. Yes, the legal the authority. Ca causing or arising out of, yep. we yeah. accept that. And yeah, no, no, absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm not suggesting you're arguing the contrary, Mr. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> exploring the point. <laughs> In, in deep money. Uh, and uh, you, you say, well, what difference should it make in terms of, of which is the body, and mm. whether the MIB is the body delicted, the task has been delegated. It would be very odd, wouldn't it, if you had a kind of artificial... Um, I would, yes. ...potential discretion left open. It would be very odd. He went slightly further mm. than just bursting through the hedge by accident. Uh, but if we're talking policy considerations and wider issues, it would be very odd in the circumstances of this case if it were found uh, to be so. And, uh, but, and it so happens the facts are, in a sense, favourable, if I can use that term, in respect of a horrible accident, um, to your client, because, as you rightly say, the vehicle was in fact being used on a road seconds before the, the accident took place. But in principle, I mean, your case must hold good equally well if, for example, the farmer had used a quad bike he had in his yard and which never went on the public roads and had carried out his pursuit with that vehicle with the same terrible results. In, in principle, I would certainly uh, agree, but I do fall back on the point that that's not the nature of my client's claim. My, cl well, my client brings a specific direct effect claim. Well, of course he does, based on the facts of his own particular <laughs> so case. How could it be otherwise? But I mean, one has to test the proposition by parallel, I mean genuinely, sort of comparable situations in order to see the boundaries of the principles which we're concerned with. My Lord, indeed. But there, there are. Um, and I don't think that's, I mean, that, that is really what Mr. Mercer was inviting us to do, as I understand it. Uh, well, there are other policy considerations, of course, uh, that one can imagine. Um, for instance, that if uh, an insured driver were driving, um, maybe on a day trip from London, because nowadays many people have four by fours, even if they only uh, live in London, um, suddenly find himself in a traffic jam and deciding to take a short cross, uh, short cut across a field. <laughs> yes. Now that driver might not be aware, as, as my Lord Lord Justice Flo is when driving in public, but might not be aware of the RTA uh, limits. And that there are real policy reasons why mm. we do use when we're looking at things, uh, things important in the protection of the victim. Absolutely, and well, as the directives make clear, in a sense, that is the driving consideration, um, or at least one of the one of the. the and on the, on the authority factors. of the Nook, I mean, that was a tractor reversing with a trailer, knocking a man off a ladder. And one can see from that that the the, um, the policy of the European Court is to give a very wide interpretation to the to the phrase "use of a vehicle." And so going, to, I mean, may, maybe not Dodgeons in a fair. I mean, that's a, an extreme example. They're not really, not by no stretch of the imagination, it seems to me that they vehicles used to transport. It's, it's a different, I mean, it's a different creature. But a, a, a quad bike on a, on a farm. Absolutely. And why does the court do that? Because of the protection of the victim. Mm. And it's marked in all of these cases, uh, in, including Smith and Lee, where, of course, the victim was paid. In all of these cases, uh, the CJE ends up finding in favour of recovery by the victim based on that overriding objective of the directive. Mm. Um, and I mean, it was probably worth, because I learned I didn't go through all of them very briefly, um, to go through the um, 
case law on milk. Before I do that, I just wanted to pick up, because of the order in which my learned friend made these points, uh, the point about uh, different bits of the state not being allowed to point at each other. Uh, and I, I hope I could do that very quickly. It's, it's the case that's of two of the authorities probably, called Klaus Conde from the Republic of Austria. <coughs> and um, uh, the Republic of Austria is, of course, a federal republic, and certain uh, obligations are fulfilled by the federal state and some by its constituent parts, known as Lenin. And the, the salient point is at page 3140, paragraph 62, for each member state to ensure that individuals obtain reparation for damage caused to them by non-compliance with community law, whichever public authority is responsible for the breach, and whichever public authority is in principle responsible for making reparation. A member state cannot leave distribution of powers and responsibilities between the members, which exist in its national legal order, in order to free itself from liability on that basis. And my learned friend points me to 63. Um, it's in fact his authority. Subject to that reservation, community law does not require member states to make any changes in the distribution of powers and responsibilities between the public bodies which exist on their ter territory, so long as the procedural arrangements of the domestic system enable the rights which individuals derive from the community legal system to be effectively protected, and it is not more difficult to assert those rights than the rights which they derive from the domestic legal system, the requirements of community law are fulfilled. But what reminded me of this case uh, was the exchange between my Lord Lord Justice Quill and Mr. Mercer about um, the responsibility of the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis the MIB. And it, it is the case in, in this action that the MIB has served a contribution notice on the Secretary of State. And, and so we, we do say that uh, however that is arranged between them, or whether the funding has to be increased in relation to the uh, insurers, and there would have been for this week the insurers in the frame that is a matter for the state. It all, it's not to be laid at our door uh, that somehow, uh, well, the money isn't uh, in the right pot or the funding isn't, uh, isn't, isn't there. Uh, so, my lords, I did say I would uh, briefly go through the Vanuk case law. Um, I don't propose to go through Vanuk itself at all, because I imagine it's been pre-read, it's an authorities bundle tab 10. That is the case of the tractor being reversed on private land. And uh, there already we have uh, a clear expression of the principle uh, as it uh, affects uh, Mr. Mr. Lewis. Uh, we haven't yet gone to Torero, and for completeness we should look at Torero, which is the next in that line of authority, and that's at 15. Torero is the case um, where, uh, if one looks at the judgment, paragraph 11, um, Mr. Torero was an officer in the Spanish army. He was taking part in military manoeuvres in a vehicle fitted with Anibau wheels in which he was a passenger. And um, uh, that vehicle overturned it was traveling not in an area for wheeled vehicles, but in an area for tracked <coughs> vehicles. And uh, at 13, we see the dispute was that the accident, it was said, did not stem from an act classifiable as use of the vehicle, since it occurred at a time when the vehicle at issue was being used on the terrain of a military exercise area, to which access for all types of non-military vehicles was restricted. And at 24, and I submit importantly, uh, the court says, uh, relying on Vnuk and um, uh, Andrade, uh, I, I thought Andrade was the one next. Uh, it's actually before this one. I'm about to come to it. Uh, at 24, it must be recalled to that end, the court has held the very concept within the meaning of Article 3, the content of which essentially corresponds to that of the first and second paragraphs of Article 3 of the new directive, cannot be left to the discretion of each member state, but constitutes an autonomous concept of EU law. 
And so that aspect of the right in Farrell and Witty, Article 3, uh, the coextensive uh, right to uh, insurance cover, is uh, something that cannot be left to the discretion of each member state. Uh, and that, uh, my Lord, is the beginning um, of my answer to Lord, my Lord Lord Justice Flo's question about the system. About, about the system. Yes. Because w what we will see is it's not just about putting in place the system. You have to put in place the right as well. And that is a right where there is no discretion. And it's, it is one, uh, a creature entirely of community law. Um, and so we see at 25, in that regard, um, as stated in recital one of the directive, which codified the other directives, they progressive, progressively define the obligations of member states with respect to compulsory insurance. While the aim of those directives was to ensure the free movement of vehicles and so on, they also have the objective of guaranteeing, guaranteeing that the victims of accidents caused by those vehicles receive comparable treatment irrespective of where in the European Union the accident occurred. See to that effect all the other cases. Uh, and uh, jumping to 30, the court has held that the scope of use of vehicles doesn't depend on the characteristics of the terrain, in 31, there is moreover no provision in the directive that limits the scope of the insurance obligation and of the protection which that obligation is intended to give to the victims of accidents caused by motor vehicles to the use of such vehicles on certain terrain or on certain roads. So there is no limit to the scope of the obligation, the coextensive obligation on the member state, which includes, in this case, um, vehicles on certain terrain. In our case, I say, uh, by analogy, direct analogy, private land. So it's not just a system. You have to put in place the rights. Uh, and we've seen reference in this case to Andrade, which I wrongly thought was after uh, Torero. Uh, one of the salient points about Andrade is the same point my uh, uh, Lord, Lord Justice Henderson made to me about Farrell, namely it's a Grand Chamber case. And it is the Grand Chamber case that effectively confirms and explains Vanuk. I, I needn't go to it. Um, it's uh, a case where uh, there was a tractor on private land, but on that occasion it was being used as a tractor. In other words, as a um, a spinning device to drive another machine. And um, on the facts of that case, therefore, it was not the use of a vehicle for the purposes of the directive. But the uh, law uh, is at paragraphs 31 to 38, and um, the conclusion is the same as in Vanuk. At 38, it follows that use of vehicles within the meaning of Article 3.1 covers any use of a vehicle as a means of transport. So that's uh, Andrade, and um, that brings one uh, to the case of uh, Juliana, uh, which my learned friend did rely on, and that's at Authorities Bundle 16. That was the lady who had stopped driving her car and had left it in her yard, and somehow her son got hold of the keys to the car and managed to uh, get it to go and drove away with it. And um, what is interesting about this case, I submit, is, is twofold. The first is uh, it involves a fund not unlike uh, the fund in, in this case, although um, presumably set up rather differently in Portugal. Uh, in, uh, in that case, there seemed to be no dispute at uh, paragraph 11 of that case uh, in the judgment, page four, uh, that in accordance with um, the national law, it was for the fund to pay compensation. The question was whether they could claim it back from uh, Juliana. Uh, and uh, the, the court in Portugal had held at 21 that there was no obligation to take out a contract of insurance against civil liability in respect of the use of the vehicle concerned. That's why uh, Ms. Juliana thought she had a case against the fund. Uh, 
um, at 24 to 26. That is again explained by the CJU. Um, they say, well, at 24, we have the judgment in Vnuk. Use of vehicles is covered. However, at 25, it's said to be different in this case since a contract of insurance had not been entered into in the present case and it was immobilized on private land and was used without the owner's knowledge or permission. In such a situation, the referring law appears to consider that there was no obligation to take out insurance cover. Uh, and why am I making uh, such a point of this? And that's uh, explained in paragraph 40 of the judgment in my submission. Which Sorry, is what was the paragraph you were just reading from? I was reading from 26. I, I read 24 to 26 of the judgment, yeah. explaining the, the situation. So the referring court, the Portuguese court, thinks there's no obligation to take out insurance because of its national law. Because the national law says that it's immobilized on private land, that's not within the scope. And, and that's the point, my lords. Um, this is a scope of the obligation case. We see that at paragraph 40, um, where the court points out, unlike in particular the cases which gave rise to Vnuk, Andrade and Torero, in which, as regards motor vehicles for which civil liability insurance had been taken out in respect of their use, the Court of Justice was called upon to specify the situations in which use of the insurance vehicle falls within the scope of the insurance cover thus taken out. The main proceedings concern the separate issue of the scope of the obligation to take out such insurance, which must, for reasons of legal certainty, be determined in advance and is before any involvement of the vehicle concerned in an accident. And it, it is in that uh, connection that the court goes on to find uh, that uh, 41 in the last few lines, um, the, the, uh, <coughs> the concept of use of vehicles um, as interpreted does not in any way mean that the determination of whether there's an obligation to take out such insurance should be dependent on whether or not the vehicle at issue was actually being used as a means of transport at a given time. In light of the foregoing, it must be held vehicle which is registered and hasn't been officially reformed for use and which is capable of being formed corresponds to the concept of vehicle. Consequently, it does not cease to be subject to an insurance obligation on the sole ground that its owner no longer intends to drive it and immobilizes it on private land. And then we've had um, my learned friend take your lordships through um, uh, the, the next page. The, the important coextensive paragraph is at 46, and I have explained, uh, my lords, how I say um, the case of Torero explains the importance of this coextensive duty because it's a duty to which there is no discretion. Uh, and it is coextensive with the scope of the general insurance obligation laid down in Article 3.1. So Article 3, Article 10, coextensive, uh, the obligatory intervention of that body is true, the way how this is put in this case, the obligatory intervention of that body in such a situation cannot therefore extend to situations in which the vehicle involved in an accident is not covered by the insurance obligation. But if I may turn that around, the, um, as the European Court would say, a contrario point is that, that the obligatory intervention of that body in such a situation does therefore extend to situations in which the vehicle involved in an accident was covered by the insurance obligation. And in this case, uh, we see um, that uh, uh, the court has found that the vehicle was so covered. Uh, and we see that in particular 48 following. Um, and uh, the finding at 49, sorry, 50. In those circumstances, the vehicle was subject to the insurance obligation laid down in Article 3 uh, because it was in working order, could be driven was registered in the member state. And so in those circumstances, uh, the uh, obligatory intervention of the body extends to it, in the case of Juliana, as it does here. The obligatory intervention of the MIB extends to uh, Mr. Lewis's situation because the insurance obligation, as we know from Vnuk, extends to That broadly covers my uh, response to Mr. 
Mercer's system point, uh, that leaves me only to respond uh, most directly to the use of uh, Chonka, and I will do that uh, most conveniently by uh, distinguishing it and referring uh, your lordships to the judgment of my lord, Lord Justice Richards, in Delaney, which is in the supplementary bundle of authorities at tab four. Delaney was a Frankovich damages claim in relation to the same Article 1.4 of Council Directive 84.5. In that case, there was an exception in the insurance contract um, for uh, um, vehicles that are being used in the course of a criminal enterprise. And for various reasons, the uh, insurer and the MIB were out of the picture, and the uh, claim was directly against the Secretary of State. In that case, um, a not dissimilar argument uh, was run uh, against me by Mr. Kennelly acting for the Secretary of State in relation to Chonka. Uh, and um, in consequence, uh, the, uh, both the trial judge and the Court of Appeal uh, had to deal with that argument. And it's convenient to pick it up at paragraph 23 of the judgment of um, the Court of Appeal at page 5,219. And the facts are summarized at 23. In Chonka, the Court of Justice was considering a situation in which the applicants had been covered by insurance policies, but had been unable to recover compensation because the insurer had become insolvent. And the relevant question with Articles 3 and 1.4 required the establishment of a national body to ensure that such, such compensation was provided. The court answered that question in the negative. And there's then a citation from Chonka, uh, much of which my learned friend has taken your lordships to. Um, and I would like to uh, take your lordships next to paragraph 30, where uh, Lord Justice Richards uh, starts by summarising Mr Justice Jay's views, uh, and at 30, page 5223, as regards Tronka's case, JJ considered the principle of community law vouchsafed by the case to be clear. At 5758, an Article 1.4 compliant regime does not have to guarantee the satisfaction of the insurance obligation in some general way. The national body is not a long stop to meet the obligations of insolvent insurers. The guarantee which Article 1.4 mandates is limited to cases where there is no insurance policy in existence at all. In my judgment, Chonka's case has no relevance to the situation where an insurer seeks to avoid liability to the victim, either on the basis of misrepresentation or non-disclosure, uh, and so forth. And the challenge to the judge's conclusion is then uh, addressed at page 5224, at paragraphs 32 following. Um, 32, on behalf of the Secretary of State, Mr. Kennelly submits that nothing in the text of the second directive provides that the exclusions set out in Article 1.4 are exhaustive. And there is uh, then more. At 33, I have no hesitation in rejecting those submissions. Uh, I agree with the judge's reading of the directives, and like him, I take the view that it is strongly supported by the case law. Uh, and 33.1, the natural reading of Article 1.4, the only permitted exclusions are those set out expressly in the article itself. That was the, uh, the main argument in, in Delaney, that somehow further derogations were permitted and the conclusions of um, uh, Mr Justice Jay and of the Court of Appeal, uh, uh, as um, Sir Stephen Richards will recall, uh, were that they were not. Uh, but then relevantly, uh, uh, over the page at 5225, 5, uh, 6 and 7, um, it is true that in order to alleviate the financial burden, a member state is permitted to exclude the payment of compensation in certain cases. The extent of that permission is expressly defined in the article itself. Six, although the cases from Bernalda's to Farrell's case, and that was Farrell 1, Farrell 2 hadn't yet been decided at this stage, although they were concerned specifically with the obligation to provide insurance cover, so that's the obligation under Article 3, not with the obligation under Article 1.4, that's now Article 10, 
to set up or authorize a body with the task of providing compensation for damage or injuries caused by unidentified or uninsured vehicles, the reasoning in them has a direct bearing on the interpretation of Article 1.4 for the reasons already given. And then it's accepted um, that uh, Chonka doesn't uh, require the national body to, to provide a guarantee scheme at 7. And if we turn over the page to 5226A, that is because Chonka's case itself concerned a situation falling outside Article 1.4 and is of no assistance to the Secretary of State's argument. And that's really the point about Chonka. The point about Chonka is that it concerns a situation out with the scope of Article 1.4, now Article 10. It's not within the scope of the Member State's obligation to provide an insurance scheme for insolvent insurance as part of this directive. So it's got nothing uh, of substance to add or, or detract from uh, the cases that are on point at the time that included Bernardi's and Farrell, one. Uh, now, of course, Farrell, two, and uh, the Nook, a for sure. Uh, and and uh, may I point out that at six, even though neither Farrell nor Torero had yet been decided, um, Lord Justice Richards uh, presciently recognised the coextensive nature of the obligation to provide insurance cover and the <coughs> obligation to set up or authorise a body the task of providing compensation for uh, the same. Uh, because that's what paragraph 33.6 of Delaney uh, finds. And so I respectfully submit that really puts to bed the system stroke Chonka point. Uh, Chonka is a completely different uh, uh, case on its fact because it concerns a situation outside the scope of the directive. Uh, and uh, it's, you cannot on any view, looking at Farrell number two at Torero, uh, as already uh, foreseen in Delaney, it cannot on any view be the correct interpretation of the case that there are somehow uh, there is somehow an abstract obligation to set up a system and a, a different obligation to set up an insurance requirement. The two are coextensive in every sense. Um, my lords. And uh, unless I can help your lordships further, I, I noted that my uh, learned friend did not revisit, in fact, I think expressly um, uh, abandoned his case that somehow the language isn't sufficiently clear. Uh, that, was not, that was not argued today, so I, I don't need to address it. Uh, oh, I, w one final point. Um, my learned friend, right at the end, mentioned the case of Smith and Mead, um, but... I, uh, I submit I, I don't really have to say very much about it. Smith and Mead was the case of um, horizontal direct effect between a, a victim and a private person, such as FBD. It adds nothing to the old case law, starting with Pacini, Dory, and others. You can't have horizontal direct effect of, um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, directives. So unless I can assist your lordships further, those are my submissions. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Mazar. Yes. yes sir. What was being held in number one uh, it was concerned with the, it was the, it was the only decision on direct effect of the motor, of the motor directives. Uh, it was concerned with Article 12 of the current directive, Article 12.1 of the current directive, because the provision in issue, uh, Article 1 of the third directive, subject to changing the article numbers because the, uh, the, the directive is now being consolidated. Uh, it, was the, it, was it was giving precision to the victims, identifying the beneficiary. And so Article, article 12, because it deals with uh, compensation to all passengers, uh, and so Article 12 is clarifying the content of the right. The question of direct effect of Article 3 before your Lordships in this case was not asked because the compulsory obligation to ensure had been implemented. So that's 
because when we learned friends' submissions, there was some debate about which provision it was, but it was it was Article 12, and it is in the same terms. Uh, the second point is that just because Article 12 is directly effective doesn't mean that Article 3 is directly effective where that obligation to require insurance has not been implemented. So, so for example, going back to Frankovich, we went through it in the judgment earlier, where the, even there, where the beneficiaries and the content of the right were clear, still no direct effect was uh, given to those clear provisions. So one has to identify, one has to analyse the particular provisions at issue. So here, the beneficiaries and the content may be clear, but the directive con contemplates requirements being imposed on third parties. The, it was suggested at one point that the, that by one of my lordships, uh, that the cases where direct effect was not given were on another directive. Well, that's as maybe, but I, one, one few, well, I would submit that the policy considerations in favour of protecting the wages of employees are of a similar nature to the uh, policy considerations of protecting the interests of uh, those people injured in accidents. There's a similar protective purpose. One can't get anything from the fact that it was another directive. The line of friends submitted that if the body designated, if there's a body designated, then Garavaran shows that this is sufficient. Sufficient. No, that depends on the facts, because in Garavaran, Swedish state was the only body, uh, and they were saying, but a particular subclass of claimants is not worthy of protection. Well, that so that that was swept away in Hampshire. The Pensions Protection Fund was clearly, it was 64 of the judgment, clearly the body to carry out the analysis of whether the pension uh, assets of the pension fund, the Roman pension fund, were sufficient, uh, and then to take over the liability if they were not. So there's no doubt in either of those cases about the identity of the body. Nguyen Fen referred to paragraph 126 of Alana Sharpson's opinion, the other general uh, uh, Sharpson's opinion, in, uh, in Farron Witty, uh, and we stress in that paragraph, uh, the end of the paragraph, where it's of the same type because it imposes a, re a residual liability. I suppose we'll just go to that. The, uh, in tab 12, that's page 1212. Here, the direct effective right is found to assert is precisely the type of right for which Ireland had already conferred residual liability where the driver is under 10,000 insurance. So that, and it was only residual liability because Ireland had required Mr. Whitty to be insured. And so it's the same type of right because it's the same, a similar sort of residual right. That's exactly what the Article 10 body is there to do. Uh, Lundgren was asked by my Lord, 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 Lord Justice Henderson just before lunch about the source of the obligation. That's interesting because Lord Lundgren didn't come back to it in his, in his submissions. And in Farrell and Whitty, the MIBI had agreed to satisfy the bulk of the Article 10 liabilities for people such as Mr. Whitty. Uh, and Article 12 prevented their excluding uh, uh, Mrs. Farrell's claim. So, and, and the way it did that was that the exception for passengers in national law that could be read down due to the direct effect. So that gives you the source of the obligation. The source of the obligation arises out of national law. Here, uh, the, there's no insurance obligation and there's no agreement with regard to the, to, to the private land accidents. So we say, so where is the source of the obligation? And while I think about it, Lords, obviously, if, if your lordships are against me, it would be important, obviously, to identify the source of that uh, liability, uh, because for the future, uh, liability qua MIB, in terms of what it agreed to do, or liability qua as if it were part of the Department of Transport, uh, is an important issue going forward. The line of friend. took your lordships to paragraph 20, 39 of Farrell and Whitty, and he stressed those words uh, to remedy the failure of a member state. 
I think I, I should have said it in my opening submissions that the failure, when one looks at the French, because of course these are uh, the, deliberation, the deliberations are in French, and the judgment uh, is mostly written in French, but the, the, to remedy the failure is the same word used in both Sanka and in this case, the défaillance. And défaillance has the, has the notion of, uh, of a, a system which breaks down. So if your car runs out of petrol, so, or, or perhaps more particularly if, you're, if you have a puncture, that's a défaillance in the system constituted by the car. And so there's no, we would submit, no relevant uh, distinction between what is being said there. It's the défaillance, it's the, it's the, the failure in the system of the member state. The my learned friend said also, on the basis of paragraph 42, that articles 3 and 10 were being direct, uh, given direct effect in uh, slightly unclear language. No, uh, article 12 had been given direct effect in Farrell Witty number 1, and all that uh, paragraph 42 is, 42 is saying, like the dispositif right at the end of the judgment, uh, it it's answers the question uh, in the abstract, so where there are <coughs> provisions capable of having direct effect, in this context, that means Article 12, 12.1. Uh, they may be arrived on, on against a body, uh, private body on which a member state has conferred a task in the public interest. Uh, but he, he doesn't get from that, he doesn't get anything about Article 10 being a direct effect. Because there's no direct effect there against the MIB, MIBI, uh, there's still up to the National Court to interpret the task, in fact, allocated. For Gara Varan, <coughs> my friend said, well, the case law's moved on. With respect, not. It's wholly consistent. Uh, and I've already made the point that there the Member State had clearly designated uh, itself uh, as the body, the only body which was ever going to provide protection. Uh, and so it was absolutely clear that the State was liable. Uh, and it's a, there's a close analogy there with Baron Witte. It's the distinction between defective implementation on the one hand and partial absence of implementation uh, on the other. In relation to paragraph 56 of my Lord Lord Justice Flo's uh, judgment in, uh, in Bern, uh, holding that uh, the MIB was the body, it must be read, of course, in terms of the understanding of the scope of Article 3 at the time. The known world did not include private land at the time. Uh, there, was, uh, the, the, uh, there was no belief that Article 3 uh, would extend beyond roads and public places. And so it's a different question uh, whether uh, it's possible to have further Article 10 bodies in the light of what is known today. Uh, on the point about my friend's point, uh, Mr. Uh, that, that here the vehicle had, been, had just been driven on a road. Well, there are, of course, as I've said, the, the policy. I mean, we're here dealing in principle with the issue, as one of Justice Henderson pointed out, the, the question of insurance with respect of accidents on private land. Uh, and the policy questions, which I've already raised in my uh, opening submissions, uh, remain. If, of course, we are liable because the vehicle, in this case, because the vehicle has just been driven on a road, uh, then we would ask uh, respectfully that that be uh, made, made clear in the judgment. Uh, in Conley, uh, tab three of the authorities, or sorry, possibly tab two, uh, I, we do stress paragraph 63, member states do not need to change the distribution of powers uh, and responsibilities. So that I mean, this is an unusual case because normally if the Department of Transport were uh, made the Article 10 body, uh, there would be nothing in the Department of Transport's uh, remit which would uh, limit that. It would be the uh, nominators of the Article 10 body. Here, we simply stress the, the express limitation by way of the delegation which has been made to the MIB. Uh, Land friend went in tab 15 to Torero. If I can just go briefly back to Torero, just to highlight paragraph 25. Land friend had gone to paragraph 24, 
and said that Article 3 is an autonomous concept. Absolutely, I'm not arguing against Article 3 uh, providing for an autonomous obligation. On whom? An article, paragraph 25 answers that. In that regard, as stated in the various directives, uh, sorry, in the title one, that directive codified earlier directives, those directives progressively defined the obligations of member states with respect to compulsory insurance. And we rely on that because it's the obligation of the member state. Perfect, uh, it, it's simply the division of power and allocation of power under the directive. In relation to Juliana, uh, learned friend observed that uh, there was no obligation to insure, said the, said the Portuguese court. Uh, and Article 3 said the court, said the court of justice uh, is to be broadly interpreted. But, but then my friend went on and said, well, uh, does the obligatory intervention of the Article 10 body extend to this case? With respect, the, the Court of Justice does not answer that question because it's giving an interpretation. It gives, first of all, an interpretation of Article 3, uh, and then it says that it's up to national law to determine whether there's a right of recourse uh, by the fund uh, uh, against uh, others. That's a matter of national law. But the, so interpreted Article 3, that's the task of the, of the court. As regards the practical consequence, uh, one suspects that the answer in that case was, well, national law is sufficiently malleable to be interpreted to comply. And so there is an obligation uh, on uh, Mrs. Juliana uh, to ensure. But the CJU doesn't go into that, as we see in all of the cases except Farron Whitty. It doesn't go on to the, the consequences. And indeed, the learned friend Skeleton, he, he, he uh, must, uh, there's a slip where he says that Sonka decided direct effect. Uh, it doesn't. It's the last question. It's a question the court says doesn't arise. And so, uh, but the learned friend, coming on to Sonka, uh, he accepts that the, uh, the guarantee in Sonka is not uh, general. Uh, the, I mean, what Sonka was, of course, dealing with the question of uh, the possible exclusions, and essentially finds. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Sonka, the, the uh, Delaney was concerned with possible exclusions, uh, and, uh, 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 and the finding is that uh, EU law has harmonised uh, the possible uh, exclusions. But both, I mean, Sonka certainly envisages a system being introduced and a breakdown in them, and on the uh, 5225 uh, in uh, Delaney, in the Supplemental Fund of Authorities, At, uh, right down at the bottom of the page on 5225. It's, it's the sentence which goes over the page. In those cases, however, so that cites Sonka, however, the payment obligation is subject only to the exclusions and limitations specified in Article 1.4. So that's uh, effectively saying that well, you, can't, you, you can't exempt people who use a vehicle for crime uh, and you can't exempt uh, passengers. Uh, but that's not going to the same point as I've been making about the, the scope of the compulsory insurance obligation uh, and the uh, coextensive obligations uh, of the MIB. And we ask again rhetorically that where uh, at the end of this is the source of the obligation against the MIB. Well, Lords, unless I can assist your Lordships further. I'm sorry, Lord. Okay. Cases, uh, the, the, the court itself expressly acknowledges that these cases are mainly a uh, question of interpretation of the relevant uh, articles of the directive as opposed to dealing with the practical consequences. Yeah. So the court did expressly acknowledge that in that regard. Yes. Thank you very much indeed, Alex Mercer. Yeah, yes, my Lord, I, I have no right to come back. I just want to make one correction, if I, I may. Uh, well, uh, Submission of what you said. A submission thinly disguised as a correction of something my learned friend has said. Um, he said that I, I didn't come back to my Lord, Lord Justice Henderson, on the source of the obligation. 
I, I thought I had, and just in case it's um, slipped through, my answer to the source was, the source was the directive as applied against the emanation of the state. Um, and perhaps to add one new thing, I should, for completeness, have recalled my Lord Sir Stephen Richard's point that uh, the articles of the emanation in this case, of course, refer to the directives uh, at Article 2.1a. But th that was my answer to the source of the obligation. It's EU law. Thank you. You say paragraph 37 is a problem in this paragraph 3. That's right. Spell that out very clearly. That's right. That's the, the key paragraph. So it's no answer to say, well, where's the source in the national law? Because the source is the paragraph. Oh, well, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Mr. Mercer, do you want to come back to that retaliation? <laughs> well, I think, Lord, I think we've got my I think we have questions. Yes, yeah. no, thank you. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you both very much for your very clear and helpful both written and oral submissions. And of course, that extends to those, your juniors and those behind you as well. Um, we will reserve our judgment, um, let you have them in writing and draft in the usual way. Um, and then please, uh, in accordance with the usual rubric, correct any typos and obvious mistakes, but don't attempt to re-argue the case. And we will, uh, and try to agree in order if we're able to agree it so much the better, if not submissions in writing, and we will deal with issues on paper unless we notify you otherwise, and therefore no need to attend to the handout. So thank you again both, and all of you very much indeed. Goodbye.